in thinking about Galatians chapter 6, I can't help but think that the, the theme of Galatians being faith alone and grace alone through Christ alone. And what that looks like is love. And that's what God's church is supposed to look like. If God is love and Jesus Christ is a representation of God, that's what the church should look like too. So I was reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we have a lot of definitions in our world about what love is, but the Bible defines it very directly. It says, if I have, in verse 2 of chapter 13, if I have the gift of prophecy, and I understood all of God's secret plans, and possessed all knowledge, and if I had faith so that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. Nothing. And that's kind of what's happening in Galatians, is people have taken the love of God, they've taken God's message They've taken God's plan, and rather than turning it into love for each other and love for the world, they've turned it into rules and regulations by which they could judge the world, judge themselves, and fall right back under the same trap that we all do. God wants to deal with us as children. He wants to see us, he wants us to see ourselves as perfect in his eyes because of what Jesus did on the cross. If you really, truly have a love relationship with God like that, it shows. It really shows. You can't, it's really hard to drum up love for other people when you're not feeling it yourself. When you don't know how you are with the Lord. You're not firmly planted in love with him. And if you set up a system by which you can feel good about yourself, well then it's easy to look down on others. And that's kind of the trap of a relationship with God based on your own performance. When you're doing really well, it makes you kind of self-righteous. And I think the world has had a lot of self-righteous Christians, and so they have a bad taste in their mouth. Or you don't measure up like you're supposed to, and then you have self-loathing. You feel really bad about yourself. You walk around self-centered and feeling deficient. And if you've been around people like that, they're not much of a blessing. They're more of a drain. So God, in his infinite wisdom and his great love for us, said, you can be right with me because of what my son did. And then it comes down to faith in Christ. And that's the basis by which we live and breathe and move. I'm, I'm amazed this morning listening to all the announcements of this church because um, we're a church <laughs> with no programs. <laughs> There's an awful lot of stuff going on for no programs. And, and when I say we're a church with no programs, what I mean is we're not sitting back in the leadership. You know, the elders of the church aren't sitting back and coming out with programs for you guys to perform so you can be better Christians. That's not the goal. Never will be. That's not what we're about. What we're about is nurturing you in the love of Christ and saying, this is what the Bible says. That's why we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That way I can't twist it up or whack it out. I don't get to skip the things I don't like. I don't get to keep teaching on the same subject every week if I like that subject. It spreads it out. It says this is the whole counsel of the word of God. And I think people really grow to that. That really builds people up. It's almost like God manufactured the Bible for his people. <laughs> he like specially balanced, balanced nutritionally exactly what you need all the time. And that way if we come across a, a passage, you say, hey, you were talking to me. I'm like, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> that was the next chapter. Maybe that's God talking to you. That's why I'm always quick to put the Bible up and go, is this the Bible or is this me? Did I just say that, or did the Bible just say that? And if I say something, you can just cast it aside. I'm just another guy. But if the Bible says it, you have to go, hmm, something's got to change, and it probably isn't the Bible. <laughs> it probably isn't the Word of God. It's probably not Holy Scripture that's going to change. It's probably going to be me. That's when I started to grow up in life, in my own Christian walk, 
when I heard somebody teaching the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and every now and then it would tick me off. I'd say, I don't like that. And God would kind of say through his Holy Spirit, what didn't you like, what that guy said or what the Bible says? If it's what the guy said, you can go, huh, just a guy. If it's what the Bible says, well, then we better stand up and take notice. In chapter 1, Paul said that the gospel was given to him supernaturally. Just God himself gave him the gospel. It wasn't something invented by men. And then he verified it through the apostles at the Council of Jerusalem. And then he defended it against the apostle Peter when Peter started to get weak on the gospel and wanted to go back to rules and regulations. Then he later on proved in chapter 3 and chapter 4 that it's proven by the Holy Scriptures and by the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of ironclad what God has done in his word and how Galatians is, like I said before, a missile. It is a, it is a, a sharp object to combat this idea of Jesus Christ plus, or not all Jesus. That Jesus Christ alone is what saves us. So in chapter 6, or actually chapter 5, verse 26, it says, Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. He's saying this message of grace, sometimes people can live, and we look a couple verses earlier, they can say, oh, I'm just going to accept grace and live any way I please. That is not why Jesus died on the cross. So you keep living the same kind of life, the same kind of miserable life. And he did not also, but he also lived, he wanted us to live it so that we were an example to other people. So sometimes we call it, in the Christianity, we call it backsliding. Like if you're living the standard that God wants you to, and then you start slacking off and you get too much in the flesh, we call that backsliding. And that's a danger. You can go too far that way. Then there's this danger of front sliding. You probably haven't heard of that. (laughs) Front sliding is when you get ahead of God and you make a bunch of rules that don't exist. And that way you can cross your arms and go, hmm, why aren't the rest of you people living like you're supposed to? What's wrong with you all? You're not sold out. You're not hardcore Christians like me. So you can be both ways. You can get a slack and get too hardcore. It says that we shouldn't become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation to yourself. He's speaking in general, but he's also speaking specifically about this idea of backsliding or front sliding. That if you see that happening, you should gently and humbly correct that person. Um, there's a, a passage where Jesus talks about judging. He says, make sure you take the moat, which is like a beam out of your eye, before you take the splinter out of your brother's eye. It doesn't say don't take the splinter out of your brother's eye, does it? It says take care of yourself first, then go to them. Here it says gently and humbly go to that person and correct them. Correction is part of love. Confronting somebody can be part of love, but we have to do it in a loving way. But just because you do it in a loving way doesn't mean everyone's always going to be pleased with you. I think from some things I said last week, people think, well, if everyone isn't real happy with the outcome, then you didn't love correctly. But sometimes when you gently and humbly plead with someone for their soul, they think that you're um, beating them over the head. I have had friends of mine that I have, have just as kindly as I could shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, and they say I'm shoving Jesus down their throat. I'm like, wait a second, I actually have called them on it. I'm like, you, said, you told so-and-so that I was shoving Jesus down your throat. How's that work? Well, felt like it. (laughs) You can't always make people happy, but you must make sure on your end of the equation that you're doing it in a loving way, in a caring way. Because even a loving and caring thing can be misconstrued. But on our part, we're supposed to portray love. That even when we're correcting someone, it's gently and humbly. And then it says carefully and cautiously do that because 
what happens is, is when we correct someone else, we might find we're making the same mistake. It's easy to, um, easy to portray, because I can remember my kids in the back of the van, or my minivan, and they're, not, they're misbehaving, mistreating each other and losing their temper and not, not acting the way they're supposed to each other. So I'm like, what's the matter with you? Knock it off. If I have to pull over this car, you need to control your emotions. I've had it up to here with you. Oh, you're going to walk in front of the car. <laughs> so you can be guilty of the same thing that you're correcting someone of. So be careful about that. That when we're doing something correctively, it's hard, it's hard to stay in the mode of love, and it's hard to stay in the mode of even professionalism. It's easy to get emotional, especially if you're a passionate person. So be careful about that. Then it says, share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone else, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. That's a good plaque material right there. <laughs> you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. But it says, bear one another's burdens. There are 59 one another's in the New Testament, how we're supposed to treat one another. How can you one another each other in 59 different ways if you don't go to church? I'm obviously speaking to the choir. You're all in church today, right? But if you get involved in church and you start getting involved with your brothers and sisters, then those one another's come in, into play. I've had people tell me, I don't need to come to church. I'm like, well, why don't you think you need to come to church? I mean, the Bible says you're supposed to go to church. You know, Hebrews 10, 25 says, Forsake not the gathering of yourselves. So much more, you say, the day of the Lord approaching. So how do, you, how do you get this one another stuff down if you don't go to church? So church is important to God. It's his vehicle by which to get his work done here on earth. And I know church can be a pain. I mean, I'm involved heavily in church, I can tell you. Sometimes church can seem limiting. Yeah, I got to jump through all those hoops to get something done. It's like, it's limiting for a reason. Church is also empowering. Church is what God has used. See, it's easy to be a good Christian in a room by yourself. But when you're in a room of knuckleheads, it's hard to be a good Christian. <laughs> we rub up against each other. We knock the edges off each other like steel on steel. We make each other sharper. We make each other better. We do one another's to each other until we're refined. Because I, I, I personally know of a guy right now who loves, says he loves the Lord, and he knows more doctrine than most of us put together. But he can't stand to come to church because when he comes to church, it's a real downer because everyone's so sinful. So... Church brings him down. I'm like, wow. <laughs> That's not Christ like at all, is it? Christ loved people. He loved to be around people, even though he was flawed. And so, if you have Jesus Christ indwelling you through the Holy Spirit and you're his child, how come you're so unlike him in your attitude? That's just pride, is what it is. Because you're fooling yourself if you think you're a good Christian, but when you get around Christians, you hate them. Because the Bible says, if you say you love God, but you hate your brother, you're a liar. That's, I mean, that's just so. When I'm hating on Christians, I go, it's not their problem. It's my problem. I'm the one with the attitude. First person that ticks me off during the day, I figure it's probably their fault. <laughs> Good guess, maybe, you know. Second person... Start to get suspicious about the third person I have a problem with. I'm like, I think you're the problem, young man. <laughs> it's not them out there, it's you. You got a problem with everybody. When you got a problem with everyone, you're the problem. <laughs> I suggest that when the first person ticks you off, you might want to examine that maybe it's not them either. I think that's wisdom. But we're to bear one another's burdens, and you can't really know 
how to bear someone's burden unless you're their friend and know what their burden is. So you have to get to know them. In verse 4, it kind of shifts gears a little. It says, pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself with anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct, or we each have to carry our own burden. This is the part where it looks like the Bible is contradicting itself. It says, bear one another's burdens, and it says, bear your own burden. Which is it? Well, it can be both. Because I can bear your burden, but my goal isn't for you to go around bearing my burden. Notice it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, put your burden on other Christians. It says, bear one another's burdens, and it says, bear your own burden. In um, Ephesians chapter 4.28, it says, let him that stole steal no more, but let him labor with his hands, that he may have something to give to those who are in need. I think this is probably the blight of our last several decades on men. And every chance I get a, a, take a shot at this, I do, because I think men in our culture have been taught it's all about you. And for a man, if it's all about you, it's not too hard to live life. You can operate on about 20% capacity and have yourself a wonderful life. But men are supposed to operate at 100%, and they're supposed to pull the wagon. They're supposed to help the weak. They're supposed to be something in society. They're supposed to be leaders. They're supposed to forge ahead. They're supposed to be champions. They're supposed to be heroes. Instead, I'll say a stereotype here. They're in mom's basement, eating Doritos, drinking Mountain Dew, playing video games. <laughs> and since they have a, a desire to be a hero, they can be a hero on a video game. Because it fulfills that need. Because men need to lead. And men need to be strong. And men need to be something in society. So when it says bear each other's burdens, that's what we're supposed to look at. We're supposed to say, are you the kind of person that is in a position to help someone else out? Now maybe you're not, and I'm not here to condemn you, because we've all needed help before, haven't we? We've all been in a place where we down it out and we needed help. But the goal of your life should be to be useful, to be strong, to be vibrant, to help out people around you. Now, I'll say on the other side of it, if you need help, you need to be able to ask for help. Because when you ask for help, it helps other people bless you. It's very prideful to go, I'm not going to church today because I don't have anything to give. And some people say, I just don't, I'm not a very good acceptor of gifts. i just not a very good taker. I'm just more of a giver. And some people in my life are like that. I've had to look at them and go, that's selfish. People love it when they give to you. Say thank you. Smile and move on. You just bless them by receiving. It's not about you and how you feel comfortable. It's about what's best for other people. I've walked into church before and felt like I had nothing to give. Sat down and had someone come up to me and go, oh, Rich, you're spiritual. Would you pray for me? I'm like, oh, okay. And I end up sharing with them, and the Holy Spirit ministers through me to them, and all of a sudden I'm blessed, they're blessed. That's the way the body works. Don't sit at home and guess how church is going to turn out. Show up and participate and find yourself blessed in blessing other people. In verse 6 it says, Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. This is where they get the idea of paying teachers in the word of God. But this means more than money. It means sharing your life with them. I mean, I am, personally, this has been my dream, to do what I do, and I'm totally blessed. I'm so well cared for by you all, so well blessed by you all. I, this is, I don't, well, I read this verse uncomfortably because it's in the Bible. It's one of those times you come along and go, well, you got to read it, Rich, there it is. But we are blessed when we bless those who bless us. It is a blessing to give back. And that means sharing in all things. It says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. 
Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let us not get tired of what, doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. This is the universal law of sowing and reaping. And God put it in place. In his universe, there is sowing and there is reaping. And um, sometimes we miss this because we're grace-oriented, and God forgives everything, right? God forgives me, and I am perfect in his eyes. But if I go rob a bank, I can ask for forgiveness, but you know what? I'm going to prison. If I go out on my motorcycle and drive like a fool and get run over, the consequences are there. God can forgive me, right? But that doesn't mean the consequences are there. There's sowing and there's reaping. Don't be deceived. God's not mocked. If you're sowing in your flesh, you'll reap the flesh. You sow in the spirit, you'll reap the spirit. Um, the thing about the law about reaping and sowing is that whatever you sow, you reap the same thing. If you sow corn, what do you reap? Corn. Oats, oats. A lot of us, we sowed our wild oats and then prayed for crop failure. <laughs> and I'm not saying that God can't supernaturally remove some of the things that you've sown. And if you've, you said, well, wait a second, I spent a decade sowing horrible things and I'm forgiving you, you mean I have to reap those? A lot of times, yes. Well, then why should I be converted? Why should I be saved? Why should I be a Christian? Well, now you have someone to walk through that with you in wisdom. Now you have somebody to mitigate some of those disasters that you caused. You don't walk alone now. But I have, I have been reaping good and bad from my past. Every now and, so, now and then something comes down the pike and I'm like, yep, <laughs> that one came home to roost. Yep, I planted that one. And consequently, even spiritually good things that I've planted every now and then. It doesn't, that's the one thing. You, you reap the same thing, but you also reap more of it. That's how sowing and reaping works, right? You plant one kernel of corn, how many kernels of corn do you get back? A lot more. The other thing is, is this Time. Three factors. You reap the same thing, you reap more of it, but it's later. It's like I've been praying for a week. I've been praying for three days. <laughs> and God didn't answer me. That's not sowing and reaping. If I go plant corn in the ground and go, what happened? It didn't come up. Three days, what? everybody who's a farmer would go, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Some of us, we plant seeds in people and in our children and then we dig it up halfway through to see if it's all right or not. <laughs> How's that work out for planting? It doesn't, does it? Sometimes when a, when a caterpillar makes a chrysalis, you have to wait on that thing. And you need to pray that God gives you the wisdom to go, I'm not touching it. This is his work. God's done so much work in my life when I took my hands off of things. Because I'm a hands-on guy. Oh, if I can't, <laughs> if I can't fix it, I'm going to break it. <laughs> you know, if I break it, then I'll know how to fix it. That is not smart with people. People don't heal like motorcycles do. People don't heal like cars do. People are people, and they need to be treated gently and in love and with kindness. You need to give them time and space for God to do the work in their life. If you work in there like a clumsy mechanic, you might get something to happen, and then you'll get the glory. You might wreck it. Well, give God time and space to work, knowing that sowing and reaping is a real thing. So it's not a, in the King James, it says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 
Now, I know there are those of you out there who are feel like fainting, or you fainted a long time ago. Like, I don't think God can do that. And I can, I can identify with that. I can really identify with saying, there's some things that just are not going to get fixed. Then I would add in something like, or God's going to have to do it. <laughs> Real man of faith, right? God has worked so much. But here's what I want you to know. You need to, in faith, give that to God. And when I say in faith, go, God, you got this, and I'm believing you. I'm believing you can do this, and I'm giving it to you. There's a phrase that people use oftentimes in Christianity, and I think it's very frustrating if you're not initiated. It's even frustrating if you are initiated, but you say, give that to God. What in the world does that mean? When you're in trouble and times are hard, and so just give that to God. You're like, okay, here, God. <laughs> that didn't do anything. So recently, my wife and I were talking, and she was reading something, and I get so much good information from her. But happy birthday, honey. She's a, she's a cute cello player up here. But if you give something to God, this is what it means. God wants to inhabit every area of your life. And if you get a tough spot in your life, I look at it like a room. Here's that situation. Here's that room. And I visualize a room and I go, God, would you walk into that room with me? I walk in the room, I introduce God to the situation like he needs to know it. Like, here's what's happening, here's what's going on. I can't handle this, I've tried everything, I can't do anything. God, would you fix this? Then I shut the door and walk out, he stays there. He inhabits that situation. He stays with that situation. He's in that situation and I am pretty darn sure if God stays in that room, it's getting fixed. I have faith in him, faith that he can handle it when I'm not there. He can take care of it. He knows more about it, and that I can just walk on and do what I can do in life. That has been so liberating to me because just this idea of give it to God, what does that mean? Prayerfully, mindfully present that situation to God and go, yours. When you need something from me, God, let me know. I'll be continuing to do what you told me to do. I'll be continuing to love you and be grateful to you and being thankful to you. You let me know if I need to go back and visit that situation. Because I've seen God do miracles in those situations. I walk back in the room and blow it up in five minutes. Because <laughs> I'm a clumsy oaf when it comes to the people. So I walk back in, I go, see, you know what happened. It's like, get out. Get out. Now, there's probably a time when I'm going to be able to talk to some of the people and talk to some of the situations I've messed up, but carefully, walking in going, God, you, you've got this, not me. So I hope that helps some of you because it's helped me. It says, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should go do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. So what this means is to plan and execute blessings on other people. Have a plan to bless other people. And then follow through and do it. Now, I know as many people as there are, is out there right now that I'm talking to, that's going to come across a hundred different ways. Glory to God, that's great. Whatever way you can uniquely bless somebody, God's called you to do that. Plan to do it and do it. It says especially to those who are in the household of faith. There's an old phrase, and this kind of gives it some justice, is that charity begins at home. Christians should be the best to the people around them, the closest to them, and then radiate out from that. And I've seen it happen the other way, where people are really good at church, but at home, they're nasty. We usually reserve our worst behavior for our children, or children towards your parents, or spouses towards each other. You know what I mean, right? Or am I just alone in that? <laughs> I have some amens out there. Yeah, we, we get mean with people that are closest to us, which is really ridiculous. They're the people that mean the most. 
We should spend time close to the people, blessing the people that are closest to us, and then to those who are in the household of faith, and then that should boil over to the world. If you go out to win the world, but you got a nasty time at church, you got a nasty time at home, I think it was Charles Spurgeon said, I don't want to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ from a man who can't treat his wife right. I went, whoa, that's harsh. That's not a Bible verse, but it is Spurgeon, so. <laughs> He's a pretty weighty man. But it does play out that if you're mean to people close to you, what does the gospel mean to you? What does it look like? And that's what I'm saying when I look at Galatians. Grace and faith should translate to love. Love to the people closest to you and in concentric circles out from you. To Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the othermost parts of the earth. Paul switches gears here at the end. He says, notice what large letters I used to write these words closing in my own handwriting. So he wrote in big, big letters. Those of you who are trying to force you to be circumcised want you to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save. Even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want you to be circumcised so they can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. Legalism is a pride trip. I'm miserable, I want you miserable too. I want you to have to jump up a few steps to get into my club. And what an exclusive club we are in. Us four lock the door, no more. It's so funny because, you know, I always joked around, there's a phrase that goes around is, I don't want to be part of any club that would let me in as a member. <laughs> but, in the, but in the church of God, in the God's grace, he accepts us all. He doesn't just accept us, he loves us and justifies us and makes us perfect in his eyes. When I say he makes us perfect in his eyes, this is homework for next week. Read Ephesians chapter 1 because it's the next thing we go to after Galatians is Ephesians Read Ephesians chapter 1, and I want you to just pick out what God says about you. The characteristics that God says about you in Ephesians chapter 1. I guarantee you, if you do, you will blow your mind. You'll be like, he really says that about me? He really thinks that about me? It's absolutely true. So that's the relationship that God wants to have with you. That's the relationship he does have with you. And if you feel like you don't deserve that, what does that do? When you get a gift you really can't pay for and you really don't deserve, it humbles you. I grew up most of my life, people like, something great would happen to them and they'd say, I'm truly humbled. And I'd be like, what does that mean? But one time I went, the last church I was at, I was supposed to go to India with the pastor. Last minute, someone just steps up like the day before we left and said, well, anonymously, anonymously, someone's paying for your whole trip. I was like, what? Everything. Food, whatever trinkets you want, it doesn't matter. They're paying for everything. They insist on it. I understood what truly humbled meant. I went, who would do that? I'm getting to go to India. This is one of the most fun things I've ever thought of, and now it's all expenses paid. If you feel that way about your salvation, about your relationship with God, that Jesus Christ paid the whole price, it's truly humbling. To the extent that you don't feel it's fully paid, there's a self-righteousness or a self-loathing that nobody can fix. Nobody can fix that because God alone is the one who is the keeper of your soul. It was his at the beginning. It's his at the end. It's all his deal, and he only wants to be reconciled. And the only way you can be reconciled, you can't bring God down, can you? He's bringing you up. He's making you perfect in his eyes because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the way Galatians work. That's the way Christianity can work. 
That way none of us get to the pearly gates and say, look what I did. Judge me for my works. <laughs> I always say, when you say, judge me for my works, let me take three steps back. So we can't boast about it. He says, in 14, he says, as for me, may I never boast about anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. It doesn't matter whether we've been or circumcised or not. What counts is whether we've been transformed into a new creation. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God or the Israel of God, his new chosen people. From now on, don't let anyone trouble me with these things. For I bear on my body the scars that show that I belong to Jesus. Just briefly, I love verse 17. He says, I don't want anyone bothering me about this anymore. I got scars. That's just boss to me. I'm like, don't argue with me. I got the scars. And then he says, dear brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit. Amen. He started this book in grace. He defends grace. He demonstrates grace. He explains grace. He ends in grace. It's grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will bring me home. This grace is manifest in love. In the walking around and the talking of this and the playing this out in your life, if it doesn't equal love, it's nothing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Galatians has been such a blessing. I pray it dismantles our little systems, Lord, and breaks us down to love. That we would just strive for that perfect relationship with you through Christ Jesus. As we switch gears into Ephesians, Lord, I pray that we identify ourselves as you identify us. That we would no longer give our enemy a seat at the table to define us, Lord but we would be defined by your word, by your thoughts, by your ideas, by your holy scripture. In Jesus' name, amen.